Let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This will be our fourth lesson. So today, I want to rehearse with you some of the practical lessons that the Lord is bringing us from this text. We did the introduction three weeks ago, and we spent our time looking at the dates when was this written. We talked about the fact that this is actually the fourth letter to the Corinthians. First Corinthians in our Bible is actually the second. Uh, that was written to answer questions that uh, followed the, the first letter. Then there was what we call the severe letter. We don't have that. And then we have this letter that is the second letter in our Bible, but it is actually the fourth. This one was written later, much later in Paul's life. He had already spent a considerable amount of time with the Corinthians, about 18 months. Then he went to Ephesus. He was in Ephesus for about two and a half years. There was other travels and journeys that he embarked upon. And during this process, he went through a great deal of trouble. This letter is a very transparent letter. And I want to bring focus to that again. As we were studying the latter part of 1 Corinthians in our Bibles, we heard Paul talk about the rapture. We talked about the resurrection. We talked about his hope of being caught up with the other believers. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. He was looking forward to the coming of the Lord. But this letter is very different. Paul is in trouble. Paul is hurting. Paul is being persecuted by his own church. Paul is being persecuted by others that are not friends, uh, not members of the body of Christ, and he has suffered tremendously. We already know that he is of the Jews five times received 40 stripes minus one. I think we should understand what that is. We think about the sufferings of Christ. Jesus was beaten with the phlegra. This would be something like you would think of a cat of nine tails uh, where they had strands of leather with bone or metal wound into it. And when a person was beaten by the phlegra, the official name of this instrument, uh, their body would be mutilated. With Jesus, we learn that his visage, that is King James English, his body, was marred more than any man. And so the way he suffered was absolutely tremendous and most potent. But Paul had gone through this kind of beating, not to the degree that Jesus did, of the Jews, he said, five times he received these kinds of beatings uh, with the phlegra. And so his body mutilated, 39 stripes, 40 minus one. The reason that they would count them out is because they knew that if they continued, it would kill him. And they wanted the prisoner, in this case, to live. And I can't imagine what Paul was going through after the first time, knowing that his hands were about to be tied to that post and he would have to endure this kind of suffering again for the second time or for the third time or for the fourth time. Paul, by this time, is in great despair. And yet the Lord is allowing this. As we mentioned last week, the Lord is using suffering. Suffering is actually an act of grace. If you weren't here last week, you'll want to listen to that lesson because sin entered the world through man's disobedience and suffering then accompanies sin. And as long as the Lord is offering salvation to mankind, then suffering will be in the world. Ultimately, there will come a day when the believer who has responded to the gospel will enter into the new heaven and the new earth where there is no suffering, no sorrow, no tears. But for the unbeliever, the suffering of this present time will only continue and intensify for all of eternity. And therefore, as we see people suffering in the world today, we should be recognizing that this is still the moment of salvation. This is still the opportunity of grace. This is still an occasion when people can learn that the sufferings of this world are our fault, 
but that God uses suffering to call us to something better so that we will say, I don't like this suffering. I don't want to suffer this way and know that he is the only remedy. He is the only savior. And so suffering. Now I want to walk you through today what I'm calling the school of Christ. Suffering is a part of that. But I want to walk you through it this from the biblical perspective on the way that God has been dealing with his people since the fall and to encourage them to recognize their need for a savior. The first thing that we notice in the school of Christ is what we call the law. This was given to the Jews and only to the Jews through Moses under the old covenant dispensation. Paul the Apostle references this when he says the law was introduced because of transgressions. And so the children of Israel were in rebellion and so the Lord brought about a greater degree or codified law that would cause them to recognize their need for a savior, which included you shall have no other gods before me. And of course, by this time they were engaged in idolatry. You may remember the golden calf. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You shall not commit adultery. You shall honor the Sabbath day. You shall honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not bear false witness. We could go through the list and we begin to recognize right away that all of these things were already present in the cultures uh, that the Jews especially should have known. But because of their rebellions, the law was introduced because of transgression. So he elevated the purpose of the law to bring about man's n knowledge of their need for a savior. Paul the apostle recognized this when he said that the law was a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ. So as we begin to see our inability to keep the law, we begin to see our need for a savior. And that's the point. The law was designed to cause us to recognize that we are incapable of keeping the law. Now, Paul the Apostle, who was chief among the Pharisees, as he mentions in Philippians, he said that in the law he was blameless. Some people read that a little differently than they should. It simply means that you could not put your finger on something in his life and say, this is where you are in open rebellion against the law of the Lord. So externally, Paul was living according to the law. But Paul also recognized that no one could keep the law, that the law was the ministry of death, and that it was designed to bring you to your knees. The law made no one perfect. And so Paul must have known, as I'm sure he did, and I know you do, that we all fall short of the glory of God, which he also wrote to the Romans in chapter 3. And so Paul recognized that while on the external, someone could say, look, the guy looks perfect. But on the internal, he knew that he fell short and therefore needed a savior. All the more reason that Paul would write, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And that it was indeed the ministry of death that brought me to my knees so that I knew that I needed a savior. So the first rule of the law in the law of Christ is the Mosaic Code. The second thing that we learn about, and this is applicable to you, to me, is performance-driven Christianity. Performance-driven Christianity usually is blurred with the Old Testament laws. Now, the law was only given to the Jews, but our pulpits today are weak theologically, and so we don't understand that the law was only given to the Jews, and therefore Christians in the church age have taken parts of the law and carried them forward into the church age doctrines. And so we say, well, you know, you have to have the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments belongs to us. No, the Ten Commandments actually only belonged to Israel. But Paul, recognizing this, even in the church age, said, should we make void the law through faith? He said, God forbid. We established the law so that it becomes a high water mark or a landmark by which a person can reflect upon the standards of God. It is not designed for you to keep per se, but it is designed to show you that you cannot keep it. Couple that together with the legalisms that we have in the church today, and that is 
probably best illustrated by something I went through. When I was a young pastor 44 years ago, I was reading as many books as I could get my hands on, and I got turned on by a guy named Leonard Ravenhill. And Leonard Ravenhill still to this day is a man that I have a great affection for. He is in heaven today. He was British, and I remember talking to him just before he died and asking him about the times. What did he think of the times? I said, Leonard, what time is it? And he said, Paul, it's perilous times with perplexity in his beautiful British accent, which I favor. Well, in his book, Why Revival Tarries, the first of a series of books that I read that he wrote, he wrote this. Any pastor that doesn't spend two hours a day on their knees is not worth a dime. And so as a young pastor, I thought, well, I want to be worth at least a dime. And so I made a commitment to spend two hours a day every single day on my knees. I think I've told you the story before. I prayed every day on my knees for two hours until the days that I was on a vacation or I was sick or we were visiting and away from home and I couldn't find a place to go and pray. And in fact, it was so bad that when I didn't have two hours a day on my knees in prayer, then I was miserable and therefore a, a misery to everyone around me until I began to realize, look, I can't keep up with this. And the Lord said, I know, that's what I want you to learn. That's part of the school of Christ. You're being legalistic. I used to fast every other day. Those of you that look at me now know that I never fast. <laughs> if you knew my habits in those days, if you got within four or five feet of me, you would hear the gospel. And I made it my aim to share the gospel with somebody every single day. And I recall many times going to bed at night thinking I failed. And I was so legalistic and so self-driven in my Christian walk. I was a performance-driven Christian. And I did all of this because I wanted to be pleasing to God. I wanted to make my father in heaven happy. Only to come to realize that I was failing both at keeping him happy by my performance and in being the kind of Christian I should in my disposition in actually resting in the Lord. And so performance-driven Christianity was the second rule for me in the law of Christ, in the way down that I needed to endure. I failed to keep the law. I failed to keep my own standards. My own standards became the law unto me. Then the third lesson in the school of Christ is temptation. Most Christians, when they first come to Christ, the, the first things that they are taught is all the things they are not allowed to do. Now, I know that this is the common Christian experience. Uh, you know, okay, now that you're a Christian, you have to stop this, stop that, stop this. Uh, oh, and by the way, you have to do this, do that. And we lay upon people these burdens that become part of the performance-driven Christianity. But also, in the stop this, stop that section, we find ourselves being tempted. Now, again, we are new believers. We come to Christ and we have things that we do need to change. Maybe we were living with a boyfriend or a girlfriend and we were not married and we were engaging in sex outside of marriage or maybe extramarital sex or maybe you were stealing and pilfering at work or you're drinking too much or you're using illegal drugs or you're abusing pharmaceuticals. It, you name it, whatever it is, until a person finally starts to come to the realization that I have got to overcome these temptations of my flesh. This is normal. This is right. And so the new believer is struggling with the youthful lusts that war against the soul. And you begin to realize during that process that you can't do it. It's so it's another form of your performance-driven Christianity. Now, that's not to say that we do not overcome temptation because we do. But we do not do it because we try really hard. 
or because we work really uh, at the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines even, thinking that all of this stuff will empower us to be able to live righteously. And we fail to realize that it has to be the Lord at work in us, not our work in him. It's not going to be me trying to overcome sin. It is going to be the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us that removes us from the temptations. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. By the way, I digress. I have no time for digressions. But the Halo ad that they're now promoting, um, which is Catholic, by the way, uh, if you haven't heard me raving about this already, uh, they are leaving off, lead us not in temptation and deliver us from evil, but that's the, where they stop. And then they don't go on to say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Little things that bug me. Now you know. Aren't you glad? And so... I have to admit, um, in the processes of the school of Christ, I am grown in these things. I'm not under the bondage of the law, and I understand the Bible. I'm not now laden down with the performance-driven Christianity. I've entered into his rest. And quite frankly, like some of you, I'm not dealing with temptation like I used to. When I was a young believer, I mean, obviously, everything that we used to do in our old lives was still very close to us, and we were still tempted to go do this or go do that. I don't feel that attracted to the things of the world anymore. But then you enter into the fourth phase of the school of Christ, and that is tribulation. So trials, personal conflicts, physical sicknesses, financial difficulties, you name it. We have ought with a brother or a sister. We're dealing with our pride. There's tribulation in our lives. There's a sense in which there's no rest. There's all kinds of problems in the the horizontal part of our living. And the Lord will bring us through the horizontal side of tribulation so that we begin to recognize that we can only make it through from one day to the next by trusting in him. We don't learn all the principles of how to deal with the the tribulation of the world. It is the spirit of the living God that is at work in us to challenge us by his spirit to keep our eyes on him instead of on this uh, troublesome sea. You know, the waves and the wind that is blowing about us. And when he tells the disciples, oh, you of little faith, did you not know that he has the power over the wind and over the waves? And so as we continue to grow in the school of Christ, escaping what we thought was the law given to us, escaping performance-driven Christianity, growing up through the temptations, the natural temptations of the young believer, learning the power of God that's at work in us to empower us to live righteously in the present age, we still have to go through the fourth lesson, and that is the lesson of tribulation and how to navigate the storms of life. And we all have them. And then there is the fifth lesson in the school of Christ, persecution. Now, tribulation can be persecution, and persecution can certainly be tribulation. But in the context of persecution, we're talking about the very physical, very real painful side of the agonies of soul and body that an individual may go through in their torment in the Lord. That's where Paul was. All of this, I'm saying, to set you up again for what Paul is about to tell us in the next couple of verses that we need to study today. And so your Bibles are open. They're in your laps, I trust. I want you to look at this again with me. We're going to read from verse 3. Our text today is going to be verses 8 and 9. Just verses 8 and 9. But beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So wherever we are in the school of Christ, we're helping others. 
We're not under the law. You don't have to perform your way into God's grace. You, you can't be a disappointment to God. God doesn't learn. You, God wasn't surprised by your failures. God isn't surprised by your human weakness. He will empower you to live. He will help you overcome temptation. You, you can't disappoint him. You can't fail in him. You just need to rest in the Lord. Let him do the work in you. It's not your work in him. It is his work in you. And as you grow in these ways, you start helping others until you get to this point. God comforts us in our tribulation or in our distresses so that we may be able to comfort others who are in any trouble. So look, I've been through that. We've been through marriage problems. We've been through kid problems, grandkid problems, grandparent problems. I've lost loved ones. We've had to bury people that we will miss deeply. We've been through these things. We can help you get through this. Every one of us go through difficulties and every one of us are called to be other-centered and help the others around us through the difficulties that we go through. And so Paul says, we, God comforts us in our tribulation that we may be able to comfort others who are in any trouble with the comfort, the power of the Holy Spirit, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation abounds through Christ. It's not through our program. It's through his power. Now, if we are afflicted, verse 6, it is for your consolation and salvation. So Paul is saying, we went through this for you. God brought us through the school of Christ so that we can bring you through the school of Christ. It's effective for enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. For if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So whether we're suffering or whether we're being comforted, we're going through this process so we can serve others. Now, verse 7, our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so you also will partake of the consolation. And then Paul gets real. He gets very real. Verse 8, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that verse, I am stunned. First of all, Paul breaks the rules of leadership right here. That is the humanistic rules of leadership. I remember years ago as a young pastor, you know, you, you are in Bible school, you're being trained and you're supposed to read all these books. And one of the books that was given to me was John Maxwell's book on leadership, 21 Irrefutable Proofs of a Leader. And within the framework of this book that I got to chapter three before I threw it across the room, I realized that he was wrong because he, his style of leadership was not the Jesus style. Of leadership. Now look, if you've benefited from reading John Maxwell, praise the Lord for that. But I want to tell you that the nature of Jesus and the kind of ministry that we want to embrace, which is the nature of Jesus, doesn't match well with the secular mindset, even Christianized secular mindset of leadership. And one of the keys of leadership in the concepts of the humanist is don't ever let people see that you're weak. If you're having a bad day, put on a face. Always be strong. Always be authoritative. Always be decisive. Don't be flimsy. And how many of you know, nobody likes to follow a flimsy leader. I mean, that's natural. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I look to, for a leadership with someone, I want somebody that knows what they believe and says what they believe and that they're very convicted about it. Praise the Lord for that. Amen? But I was also taught in Bible school, keep an arm's distance from the people that you pastor because if they get close to you, they're going to see that you're human and then they won't respect you. Really? I'm serious. This is the kind of thing that's being taught in our seminaries today. And when this happens, we have forgotten the Jesus style who became tired and went to sleep in the boat or was hungry or was in great need and distress and asked his disciples, would you pray with me, please? Could you not watch with me one hour? Jesus was fully human and he was close to his disciples. They saw who he was. 
And I'm glad that he did. He modeled for us perfect leadership. Paul the Apostle is now talking to the Corinthians and he is pulling back the curtain of the superstar Christian. And he says, look, guys, let me tell you about what I've been going through. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond strength. What in the world does that mean? Burdened beyond strength. This is when you say, well, you know, God will never let you go through anything that you can't handle. Have you ever heard that expression? Think again. See, here's the problem. When we say God will never allow us to go through anything that we can't handle, what we're thinking about is what we can handle. But what God wants to do to us in our school of Christ is bring us to the point where we realize it's not something I can handle, it has to be him handling it through me. In the same way we're trying to perform our way into God's grace, we cannot endure the kind of sufferings that sometimes are called upon uh, for believers, for believers in Christ in our own strength. We must have him. And so you say, well, God, you must have seen something in me that you, you, you knew something about me that I didn't know that you could allow me to go through this. No, it's not what he could see in you. It's what he sees in himself. It was beyond measure. Everything that he thought, well, I could handle this or I could handle that, he couldn't handle. And he got to the point that it was so bad that they despaired even of life. It was above what they, in their own sense, could have strength to endure. They despaired even of life. I mean, we're talking about nearly suicidal tendencies. We're thinking about, we've got to get out of this. We can't take it. Next Sunday, I'm going to talk to you about suicide. I'm saving that because I want to develop the, the lesson. But I want you to understand that when Paul the Apostle, who we think of as the superstar Christian, tells the Corinthians, I want you to know the trouble that we endured. And it was such detailed trouble that it wasn't even listed here. Later, he reflects on some of the things in, that is in the same epistle. But he doesn't tell us exactly what he went through. But he says it was so bad, it was beyond what we could have ever thought to have endured. It was beyond measure. So that we were without Strength it was above our strength, but it had to be God. We were in such despair of even life. A death sentence was upon us. Yes, we had, verse 9, the death sentence, a sentence of death in ourselves. That, and this is the key, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. See, God wants to bring us all to that very place where we don't trust in ourselves. This is part of the process of the school of Christ. Now, I hope that all of us can expect and anticipate and actually experience the rapture. There are many people in China today that wish the same, that are being tortured for Christ. There are people all over Europe that are being tortured for Christ. There are people all over Africa that are being tortured for Christ. People in the Sudan that are still suffering today. People in the Middle East that are being tortured for Christ. My friends, there's a lot of people that don't have the pleasures of American Christianity. In fact, we're so infected in America that we have the health and wealth gospel. You can have what you say. You can be rich. You can be increased with good. You can have whatever you want. You can you just confess your healing and you won't have to suffer physically if you have just enough faith. And they have forgotten to read the Bible. Paul says, I know to, how to abound and I know how to be abased. I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. And he says, look, we despaired even of life. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. But we believed, we believed that God would raise us from the dead, even if we die. So he's saying, look, don't be addicted to time. When you're going through trials, when you're going through sufferings, don't be addicted to time. God will get you through it. Whatever it is. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. Yeah, I do. We all have been through great trials and we will go through greater trials ahead. And we need to be prepared in the school of Christ to get through the law, performance-driven Christianity, temptation, tribulation, and persecution. 
until we come to the end of self. When we come to the place where we say, Lord, it's none of me, it's all of you. You are my life. You are my strength. Anybody ever hear the song, you are my strength when I am weak? See, in our weakness, he is made strong. Paul will tell us that in this letter. And so as we continue our study, we'll learn more and more of Paul's transparency, the realness of a man, the difficulties that he endured, that we may ourselves endure. And don't look ahead and say, oh man, Lord, can I take it? Because you can't. But if God calls you to whatever degree of suffering it is that you may go through, he, by his grace, will get you through, even if it means watching the guillotine come down on your neck. Because you'll say, Lord, I'll see you in a second. Amen? Before I let you go, I want to read a poem to you. I didn't plan for this, but in the first service, I started to try to quote it, and I could get the first and the last stanzas a little bit. And I decided to make a quick copy of it and bring it down. So I read it in the second service. I'm going to read it today in this third service for you as well. It's called None of Self. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when I let the Savior's pity plead in vain and proudly answered, all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me, I beheld him, bleeding on the cursed tree. Heard him pray, forgive them, Father. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, strong and sweet and ah, so patient brought me lower while I whispered less of self and more of thee. Higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last has conquered. Grant me now your spirit's longing, none of self and all of thee. That's the school of Christ. When he takes us away from self, when he causes us to recognize the purpose of suffering and how he is using it in these last days to call us to him, not to rely on self, but to rely on him. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be that I let the Savior plead in vain and I proudly answered none or all of self and none of thee. All of self and none of thee. May the Lord cause us to get to that last stanza. None of self and all of thee. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together as we pray. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for your word. Teach us, allow us to understand what you're doing and how it applies to our lives. The insights of your scripture, we pray. Bless your people. Use us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.